And good evening. Tonight we begin with the most vulnerable, small children caught in the middle of a war on both sides of this conflict. We want to show you the largest medical complex in Gaza, Al-Shifa Hospital, running out of fuel for generators and unable to care for patients, some dying from lack of oxygen and clean water. Doctors forced to take at least 36 premature babies out of incubators, you see them here, laying them on stretchers side by side, at least three of them reportedly dying, and some still clinging to life, orphaned by this war. Some of the hostages held by Hamas, also just children. An American toddler just three years old who lost both parents in the October 7th terrorist attacks, another just 10 months old. The IDF releasing new images today in the desperate search for these hostages, claiming to have evidence of Hamas fighters carrying a rocket-propelled grenade at El Quds Hospital. You see them circling the evidence there. The IDF also claiming Hamas hid captives underneath Rentisi Hospital. Images showing a baby bottle, diapers, as well as explosives, and grenades, the video possible because ground troops for the Israeli forces keep pushing deeper into Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying the military pressure has been working, hinting at a potential deal to get more hostages back to safety, but staying tight-lipped on any specific details. Critical infrastructure collapsing as Israeli forces take control of the Strip. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons once again tonight starts us off. Tonight, after days of fighting around hospitals in northern Gaza and critical medical resources in short supply, bodies piled outside and deepening desperation inside. Here, a Palestinian doctor treating a patient with a cell phone light. President Biden calling for less intrusive action near hospitals. Uh, we're in contact and we're with, uh, with the Israelis. The hospital must be protected. Israel says Hamas is using hospitals for cover. They say this is a Hamas fighter with a rocket-propelled grenade at Al-Quds Hospital, a claim denied by doctors there. But this evening, the Israeli Defense Force releasing a roughly edited video. They say shows a tunnel near Antisi Hospital. I want to show you a room where we found all the gear, the operational gear of Hamas. Including, he says, grenades, bombs and RPGs in the hospital's basement. Then Israel's military spokesman points to a chair and rope. This is a suspicion for area where hostages were being held. NBC News cannot independently verify the allegations. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have fled south, but say they're still not safe. Look at the bodies, this dad cries. Women and more children killed. The European Union, like President Biden, imploring Israel to show maximum restraint while condemning Hamas for, it says, using hospitals and civilians as human shields. And at Al Shifa Hospital, now surrounded by fighting, Dozens of premature Palestinian babies are fighting for life, with no power for incubators. We lost the oxygen body in the last night, and we are afraid not to have more oxygen. While somewhere in Gaza are children kidnapped from Israel, including three-year-old American Israeli Abigail Moridan. Both her parents were killed by Hamas. The entire Trufanov family were targeted. Dad, one of the 1,200 Israelis murdered in the Hamas terror attack. Grandmother, mother, son and girlfriend taken. Mother Yelena in a hostage video, there on the right. With no family left, friends speaking for them tonight. So we're here because they will not be forgotten. We want them to know that we're here and we're waiting for them. And we're their family for now until they come back. Kira Simmons joins us live from Tel Aviv. Kira, I can't stop thinking about that image you showed us of those premature babies in the hospitals. Is there any hope yeah. for, for, for children like that to be evacuated? Well, that's the hope, uh, but the problem is the practicality of it, Tom. Israel has said it wants that, but then the Palestinian Red Crescent, for example, at, at another hospital says an evacuation convoy had to turn back because of shelling and gunfire, and everyone watching will know that premature babies are the hardest kinds of patients to move, so it is extremely difficult. Doctors th that we speak to talk about hearing the fighting right outside the hospital, hearing shelling hearing gunfire. Those are the conditions. And as much as Israel says that it wants to try to help to get these babies out once again, and it's so much the, the case with this, uh, Tom, uh, across Gaza, the practicalities are the real challenge.
Yeah, and then we saw those other images from the IDF showing what looks to be a weapons depot, possibly hostages tortured yeah. there underneath a hospital. It speaks to the complicated nature of this war in particular. I do also want to ask you, because you've been covering this for us so well about the hostages, are, are there any updates about any potential releases? Well, it does look as if there is a plan, that there is a proposal. I think the question is the sequencing, uh, Tom, and, and in that sequencing, you can imagine, there are questions over how many hostages might be released, what kind of aid would be sent into Gaza, what kind of amounts of fuel, and, and when that would happen, what would happen when, how many days pause there would be. So, so you can see, as much as there is hope, uh, once again, it comes down to the practicalities of really making it work. Well, I think we'll find out in the days to come, Tom, because... Uh, I'm told with, by diplomats with, with knowledge of the, these talks uh, that they think that if this doesn't happen in the coming days, Israel would have pushed so far uh, into Gaza that perhaps Hamas and the Israelis, both sides, will think it is not worth talking any longer. Keir Simmons leading off our reporting here from Israel tonight on Top Story. Keir, we thank you for that. As Gaza's only children's hospital closes, some young cancer patients are getting a glimmer of hope. Joint efforts by the White House, St. Jude's Hospital, and Palestinian cancer advocates getting some children undergoing chemotherapy out of Gaza to get life-saving treatment. Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent Andrew Mitchell has this story. Victory at last for 10-year-old Juri Zakut, one of 21 Palestinian children with cancer. Safe in an Egyptian hospital, flashing a sign of victory. The children with parents or guardians at the center of a secret international mission since the war began to rescue them from Gaza. Their joy tempered by reality. <laughs> she says, I would lie if I said I was optimistic and my family is still in Gaza. I am afraid for them and our house has been hit. <laughs> Tahani came to Egypt with four-year-old Omar, leaving behind their family for the chance to save his life. <laughs> She says, I had the feeling of any mother who was afraid for her son. I was afraid that his treatment would stop. It's been a treacherous journey, especially after Israel warned the hospital and then attacked. The evacuation initiated by cancer advocates at the Palestine Children's Rescue Fund and St. Jude's Hospital with help from Egypt, Jordan and the U.S. The president was closely involved in helping children get out of Ukraine uh, that were uh, that needed cancer treatment. Immediately upon hearing about this request, uh, the president directed us to do whatever we could to help these uh, you know, civilians who were in uh, very acute situations uh, get out of Gaza. Two-year-old Afaf and her father left her mom and siblings behind. <laughs> Sadness mixed with relief. They start to smile for the first time and they start to feel secure. It's very relieving. And we hope that we can uh, do that for all the needed children in uh, Gaza. With the children's hospital in Gaza now closed, 31 children remain trapped in the war zone. Some approved to get out through the Rafah gate, but displaced from their homes and hard to locate. Tom? All right, Andrea Mitchell for us. Andrea, thank you. We want to turn now to news from our nation's capital back here at home. Last night, Secret Service agents protecting President Biden's granddaughter, opening fire outside of her home when multiple people broke into a government vehicle. The incident just the latest in a string of violent crimes hitting D.C. Here's NBC's Kelly O'Donnell. A troubling spike in crime in the nation's capital, edged closer to the president's own family. The high stakes evident. Just, I should just be advised. From the police radio. And it's a... Uh... Secret Service involved. First granddaughter, 29-year-old attorney Naomi Biden, daughter of Hunter, frequently seen at White House events. A bride here on the South Lawn one year ago. Last night, Biden was at home in the leafy and affluent Georgetown section of Washington. When officials say just before midnight, Secret Service agents encountered possibly three individuals breaking a window on a parked and unoccupied government vehicle. The incident led to a single gunshot. A federal agent discharged a service weapon, and it is believed no one was struck. The suspects fled in a red sedan. Authorities say there was no threat to Naomi Biden. And any concern about your granddaughter's safety, sir? Today, the White House did address the broader danger. We are definitely concerned about what we're seeing, and not just here, across the country, obviously. 
Washington, D.C.'s own data show a staggering surge. Motor vehicle theft up 98 percent over last year. Robberies up 68 percent and murder up 32 percent. Today, Mayor Muriel Bowser declined to comment on the first family incident. I would go to Secret Service if you have any questions. Officials say the federal agent is on routine leave, pending an investigation on the use of his weapon, while the search goes on for two or possibly three suspects who tried to break into that government vehicle. Tom? Okay, Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, we appreciate that. Now to power and politics and a major development in the race for the White House. South Carolina Senator Tim Scott announcing he is suspending his campaign for president. The surprise announcement live on the air last night on Fox News reportedly even blindsiding members of his own staff. Just last week, Scott sat down with me and Hallie Jackson after the third GOP debate. This was our exchange about his standing in the race. We know it was a challenge for you to, to, to make it to the debate stage here. Do you think tonight is your last debate, or can you t promise your donors and your voters you're going to be there oh, in a month? I'm 100% confident that 30 days from now in Alabama, we'll be hanging out having a conversation about, wow, Tim, you, you, you're actually on the stage. Of course I'll be on the stage. We're not running a national campaign. We're running a campaign state by state. That's how these campaigns actually work. If you think back to 2011 and 2015, it was Herman Cain and the 999. It, winning in Iowa right now, 2015, it was Ben Carson. So what we know is that the voters are just turning their attention towards this election. I'm very optimistic that we can continue to make gains. All right. Now, less than a week later, Senator Scott is out of the race, and we want to break down what his announcement means for the GOP primary. I want to bring in our panel tonight, Matt Gorman, senior communications advisor to the Tim Scott campaign, as well as a former aide to Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney. Rena Shah, she's a Republican political strategist and commentator, and Matt Dowd, the former chief strategist to the Bush 2004 campaign and an NBC News political analyst. Thank you all for being here tonight. Matt, I'm going to start with you, right? You're our insider here in the panel. Uh, you, you worked with Senator Tim Scott, you work closely with him. Why do you think he decided to spend his campaign now? So he was sick with the flu uh, late last weekend, and so he came home from his Iowa events early. Uh, I think over the course of the weekend, um, he realized that there was the path was pretty narrow uh, to continue on in this campaign. And look, we all know how much of a slog and how hard these things can be. And it took some time, took some personal reflection, but he realized that there really was no way to go forward with a real shot at, at winning this. And so, you know, he came to that conclusion, as we all saw on Sunday night. So, Matt Dowd, I want to put up the polls where, where the race stands right now, at least in Iowa. This is the real clear politics average. You can see Donald Trump, I call him the ultra front runner in this race, still far ahead. Uh, Tim Scott was at 7 percent, right? His voters will go somewhere. Not enough to make a difference, but it could definitely give someone momentum. Where do you think, Matt, the Tim Scott voters go? I think the likelihood, and you look at the cross tabs, is they split up in many different places. Some go to Donald Trump, some go to Nikki Haley, some may probably go to DeSantis, and probably many go to undecided until they figure out where they want to be in this. The problem the candidates have that aren't Donald Trump in this, and even in that Iowa poll, is that this isn't the Olympics, Tom. You're not getting a silver medal for finishing second. Seven months ago, Donald Trump was 10 points ahead in Iowa. Today, he's 30. And so the only thing that seems to be happening is a fight in a movement between second while Donald Trump increases his gap over time. And that's the fundamental problem in this race. And so even if those seven points move to some other candidate other than Donald Trump, Donald Trump still has a massive lead. Rena, you know, Senator Scott campaigned on a, a message of optimism and positivity. Is that kind of message just not going to win in a Republican primary anymore? I liked Scott's message of being positive and having an aspirational vision, right? And I think that was one of the very good things he brought to the race. Of course, I liked his China talk as well as his talk on energy. But what him dropping out of the race does is essentially tells us what the reality is for Republicans. Republicans love to win. And I think the GOP donor class woke up and looked at Tim Scott's run and said his stance on abortion, still probably wanting a federal ban despite the overturn of Roe, 
isn't going to work. We like to win elections. And you cannot win a general election with a guy like Tim Scott, who, again, still would want to ban. So it's a cold night in D.C. tonight, Todd. I'm going to tell you, and it reminds me, this cold weather, of the cold, hard blows that Nikki Haley dealt to Tim Scott between debate one, debate two. And I think Tim Scott read it. He knew that when he couldn't fight back, he's not the fighter that could win this primary. Uh, speaking of fighters, I know Matt Gorman wants to get in on this fight. So, Matt, what's, what's your take to, to what Rena just said? I didn't know I was debating a Nikki Haley surrogate, but I can promise you I, <laughs> that Nikki Haley was not the reason that Tim Scott uh, dropped out of this race. I can promise you that. Um, but look, he has, we have a great deal of respect for, for Governor Haley. We really, really do. Um, but look, I think at the end of the day, um, when it comes to the, the issue of abortion, this is personal to him. And I think the, the key is, whether you're Nikki Haley, who, you know, I think we're, uh, she, she's made her kind of position on abortion clear, or it's Tim Scott or whomever, um, I think it's also about tone, how you talk about it. Um, I think it's a key as well, um, and how people feel when you talk about it. Um, I think that's a key. Uh, as we hear, we go on to these further debates and into a general election, whomever it may be, the nominee, that's something I would advise the candidate to think about. Matt, is, can we expect Senator Scott to endorse anyone during this race? And would he possibly, if, if you know, Matt Dowd is right and, and former President Trump runs away with this, would, would he be on a ticket with former President Trump if he was asked? Look, I can't speak to either of those. I'll just take him at his word of what he said last night. Look, I, I think also, I mean, Tom, we, we've all kind of, and Matt, we've all done this several times. Like, when you drop out of a race like this, it is intensely personal. And, you know, you might not have every answer to every question figured out with it right away. So maybe he endorses someone, but I'll take him at his word that he won't. You know, and again, I don't think he came to this realization to end his campaign with all the answers tactically about what he would do next. So, Matt, it's, a, it's about two months before Iowa, right? Um, the debate stage is going to get smaller. There will be more attention building on this race as we get closer to the Iowa caucuses. There's still time for someone to potentially make a move on Trump, right? But you have two holidays, three holidays, if you think about New Year's, in between now and the Iowa caucuses. So, so my argument is that if you're going to make a move and, and you're going to start trying to get voters to rally around you, the, the clock is ticking. Do you think there's still enough time? And do you think there's anyone who has a message that could do that, Matt? I think there's enough Dowd. time. Oh, sorry. Think, sorry. No, that was oh, Dowd. Sorry, Matt Dowd. Oh, sorry. <laughs> two Matt's. It's OK. Two Matt's. Two Matt's are welcome. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the problem is, is you the, the six months that we've already had was the time to do that. And nobody separ nobody closed the gap. And actually, as I mentioned, the gap expanded in the course of this. And so now, as you mentioned, and I have having been through all this Thanksgiving and then basically mid December to January 2nd is a sort of a null period and to a large degree. People don't want to be seeing political ads, even though people air them. People don't want to be debating politics in that time frame in this. And so I think it's going to be very, very, very difficult for a campaign themselves, other than Donald Trump, to make any headway in the course of this. It seems that the Republican primary voters have come to the conclusion already that they want Donald Trump to be the nominee. And unless there's an external event that fundamentally changes the dynamics, which no candidate has control over, this race is looking like Donald Trump is going to start racking up wins starting in January. Rena, Rena, I'm going to get to you in a second. But Matt, I know you, you've been in Iowa. You've been on the ground there. You've, you've listened to voters. Tell me if you agree with, with Matt Dowd or if you disagree. Um, well, look, I think there is still time, number one. But absolutely, people would come up to us and they'd say, you know, we love you, Tim but I'm with Trump. Um, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Nothing's a foregone conclusion in politics, nor am I saying that's what Matt is saying. But absolutely, you look at Iowa, you look at New Hampshire. Uh, he's a former president of the United States. He has a built-in level of support there. That's hard to match, especially if you're someone like Tim or somebody else who you're just trying to get to know the electorate first, and they're trying to get to know you. You know, Rena, Matt Dowd brought up a good point about we, we've been at this about six months now. Have any candidates, in your opinion, gotten better through the process or have candidates just gotten worse here? I, I ask that because if you look at the polling, as Dowd pointed out earlier, Trump was somewhat vulnerable. He looked like he could be beat and, and now he's sort of run away with it, at least according to the polls right now. Tom, the stark reality is that Trump is still vulnerable. We have a fourth debate coming up next month, and I know that people say it doesn't matter, but I, in my estimation, I see these candidates getting stronger continually, and I don't think we should count any of them out. I think there is still an appetite for DeSantis. There is very much an appetite that's still growing for Haley. And look, when Haley started her, her bid, when she came first out of the gate, and, and she has that fundraising advantage from that, too, as does Vivek Ramaswamy, I was not for her. But what I have seen in Haley and DeSantis 
is their ability to sort of meet the moment. But Haley, a little bit more so. Again, I want a candidate that wins a general election because I look at the GOP, a party I've made my career in, and I see a party that has uh, lost essentially and at least, and if not lost everywhere, severely underperformed given expectations since 2016. And people can talk about Yunkin and they can talk about New Jersey, which was pre-Dobbs, but we have done so little winning. So I want a fighter that is able to take on a Democrat next general. And what we're talking about right now is an uphill climb. I get it for these primary candidates, but do not think that Trump is the only one. He is rife with problems. We have not had the issue that we see around this former president ever in modern history. So anything can happen. All right, Rena, Matt times two. We appreciate all of you tonight on Top Story. Thank you so much. We turn now to the ongoing campaign finance investigation involving New York City Mayor Eric Adams and his campaign investigators are now looking at text messages to FDNY officials on behalf of the Turkish government. This reporting coming days after that breaking news that the FBI seized Mayor Adams' cell phones in connection with that investigation. NBC News Chief Justice contributor Jonathan Deans joins us now on set. So, Jonathan, get our viewers up to speed about what happened over the weekend. The, the headline on Friday was so shocking to so many. Yeah, well, first, the investigation into the Adams campaign and its fundraising is appears to be growing. Of course, as you mentioned, Tom, because the mayor's cell phones were reported taken by the FBI earlier last week. The investigation is centering around questions about whether the mayor reached out to fire department officials to get uh, fast-track approval for the new Turkish embassy or consulate here in New York. It's a $300 million building, 35 stories tall, and the president of Turkey was coming in to the United Nations General Assembly, and the Turks wanted this open. And so the uh, Turkish consulate texted the mayor saying, hey, what can you do? Mayor-elect, who was the mayor-elect at the time, hey, what can you do about it? The mayor forwarded that request to the fire department, and the question is, was there any improper influence as a result of that? As of now, there does not appear to be any. The main question, the main focus about all of this is whether foreign Turkish money was illegal bun illegally bundled and placed into the mayor's campaign. That's what got this investigation started. That's what this is being focused on. Uh, it is the campaign. It is the possibility that some people out there improperly bundled foreign money and put it into the mayor's campaign. That's really the uh, hard uh, criminal aspect of this investigation so far. Jonathan, I know a lot of this is, is new to us. The reporting is new. And there's a lot we don't know, right? But you have the country's most powerful mayor and you have the FBI, part of the Department of Justice in Washington, come here to New York, seize his phones and his iPad on a New York City street as you reported and described it to us on Friday night. That's a huge deal. I can't imagine, at least it doesn't stand to reason, that they came after him because he pushed along a request to the FDNY. I mean, you have to think, and I know the report maybe he's not there yet, but you have to think this investigation is, is bigger than that. Look, grand jury investigations are conducted in secret, so there's, of course, a lot we don't know. Our best information is it is customary for the FBI when they need to seize a phone in connection with a grand jury investigation, they go to the individual in question and they take it so that there's no time to delete any information or pass it on. That's the customary approach. It just turns out in this case, the possible witness, if you will, is the mayor of the city of New York. Nonetheless, the FBI apparently went about its normal protocols and went and seized the, these phones. Were there alternatives? Could they have called the mayor's lawyers and said, hey, have him turn over his phones? Again, we don't know what the exact nature of this investigation is since it remains sealed, remains secret. Uh, but, uh, you know, FBI agents taking someone's phone in an approach to get it and see what's on it, not that unusual. What's unusual is this time it was the mayor of the city of New York. All right, Jonathan Deans for us tonight here on Top Story. Jonathan, thank you. Now to the urgent rush to avoid a government shutdown. With a Friday deadline looming, new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, unveiling his plan to keep the government open for now. His two-step strategy already facing defections from within the GOP, meaning the House's new leader will need support from Democrats to avert a painful shutdown. Here with the latest efforts to avoid that shutdown, Ryan Nobles, who joins us from Capitol Hill. Ryan, I feel every couple of uh, weeks, months or so, we're checking in with you on the government shutdown. Here we are again with the new speaker, finally. He had a two-tiered plan. Walk our viewers through what happened. 
Yeah, so at this point, uh, Tom, it looks as though he's trying to find that sweet spot uh, where just enough Republicans can defect and he picks up just enough Democrats where he can get that bill out of the House and over to the Senate and then not suffer the consequences of backlash within the Republican Party. Because, of course, this motion to vacate where just one member could bring his speakership up uh, for a vote is still a possibility, much like it was for Kevin McCarthy. At this point, no one's talking about a motion to vacate. There are many conservative Republicans, as you rightly point out, who don't seem all that happy with this short-term spending plan, but not enough to attempt to boot Speaker Johnson out of his office at this early stage. It looks as though they're willing to kind of let this slide to offer him the opportunity to negotiate a longer-term package, negotiations that would pick up in earnest in the new year if they're able to get this short-term spending plan done by Friday. So, so should we worry that, I know there's, there's been reporting out there about the plan not including funding for, say, Israel, Ukraine, mm -hmm. the southern borders. Does that need to be worried about right now, or is that that fight will happen down the road? Well, there is a reason to worry about it, Tom, and that's because uh, there are many members up here that are so concerned uh, that any type of legislation making it through the House and Senate and then being signed by the president uh, is such a difficult task to pull off that they believe coupling all these things together as a way to create leverage uh, is the only way to get everything possibly done. In other words, if you're someone that's a staunch supporter of Ukraine aid, you may be able to stomach some sort of border policy putting into the package and then maybe some sort of short-term spending plan as well. The fact when you start pulling these apart, you risk the that leverage going away, and that makes it a lot more difficult to put it over the finish line. However, Speaker Johnson's calculation, and it seems to be something that Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer agrees with, is that putting it all together is just too much of a lift, especially to get done by this Friday. So we will see a separate conversation about funding for Ukraine, Israel, the border, and everything in the weeks ahead. So, Ryan, what's your since we're four days away, you, you think this happens? I mean, you never say for sure in Congress, Tom, especially with this version of Congress, because everything is so unpredictable. But the vibes here, I think, uh, are relatively confident that they're going to be able to get something done. I think there is enough Democrats willing to partner with Speaker Johnson to get this to the Senate. And Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer doesn't necessarily love this bill, but I think it is palatable enough for him to allow it to go through so that they can have bigger long-term discussions in the future. Everything seems okay right now, but it's only Monday. We should probably check back in again on Thursday. All right, we definitely will. Ryan, great to see you. Still ahead tonight, an update on the Idaho College murders that shocked the nation. One year since four students were murdered in an off-campus house. We'll take a look at where the case against Brian Koberger, the alleged killer, stands. Could there be a plea deal in the works? Plus, a massive inferno shutting down one of the busiest highways in L.A. What we learned moments ago about how that fire may have started. And a small plane, look at this, trying to make an emergency landing in Texas, but smashing into a car on the highway. What we're hearing about the injuries on the scene and how this happened. Top story, just getting started on this Monday. All right, we're back now with some breaking news on the inferno that happened under one of the nation's busiest highways, I-10 in Los Angeles, still shut down indefinitely. And this just in, the state fire marshal now says arson is to blame. Here's Miguel Almaguer. The badly burned stretch of Interstate 10 spans only 450 feet, but its impact has severed one of the nation's busiest roadways, snarling traffic, slowing commerce, and creating logistical nightmares well beyond downtown Los Angeles. This is like a lifeline. With its structural integrity at risk, the overpass was a thriving artery that shuttled some 300,000 vehicles every day, carrying nearly twice the number of cars as the collapsed section of I-95 did near Philadelphia. The 10-lane bridge in Los Angeles is now shut down indefinitely. Our investigators um, have been able to confidently determine that the fire was caused by arson. Saturday's explosive fire, believed to be purposely set, engulfed a pallet yard under I-10, even torching a fire truck. Guardrails melted, chunks of concrete fell to the ground, and exposed layers of rebar. Just last year, the governor was next to this very section of the Santa Monica Freeway, working to clear large homeless encampments. The area where the fire started is leased to a private company. 
That company is now under investigation for how it managed the property. With no timeline on when repairs will be made, tonight a city notorious for traffic has now lost one of its busiest roadways. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. It's been rough. It's, it's been really rough. You just miss them, and, and the longer they're gone, the more you miss them, and the more you realize how badly you really have been robbed. I miss hugging Ethan. He's, he just always, he was definitely a mama's boy. I'd, I'd give anything to go back and be able to have another hug from him. That's the mom of Ethan Chapin, and just before that, the parents of Kaylee Gonsalves, Two of the four University of Idaho students stabbed to death in an off-campus home one year ago today. Tonight, a vigil is being held at the school to honor the victims. This as the suspected killer, Brian Koberger, remains behind bars. He is charged with four counts of first-degree murder and is awaiting a trial date. With more where this case stands, I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst, Angela Senadella. Angela, thanks so much for joining us tonight here on Top Story. So first, where does the, the trial stand and the trial date? So we have no trial date, even though it's been a year since the murders happened. And we expect the trial to happen in 2024, but it could be 2025. Because look, it's the defendant's right to waive the speedy trial. The prosecution has no right to a speedy trial. In a case where the death penalty like this is on the table, it's not uncommon for the defense to try to delay, delay, delay. And also, it's not uncommon for the judge to give a lot of leeway to the defense if they want more time. As one of our legal eagles, I know people have sort of, I guess they, they, they sort of opine that Maybe it's taking this long because, as you mentioned, there's a death. This is a death penalty case, but it's taking this long because maybe there's a plea deal in the works. Have you seen anything to lead you to believe that? I don't see any overt evidence at this time, but I do think there was a window, and that is when, when he was asked if he was guilty or not guilty, and what does he plead? And he said, I am not going to answer this question. So at that point, I think a plea deal was on the table. But look, a plea deal could happen all the way until jury deliberations. And those tend to not happen until they happen. Like, you don't know until they've been announced. I want to talk about the three big pieces of evidence for the prosecution right now. Put them up on our screen for our viewers so they can remember. First, I mean, the, the DNA evidence, right, the prosecution says they have on the knife sheaf that was left behind. The roommate who said she witnessed somebody that looks like Koberger, bushy eyebrows, wearing all black, leaving one of the rooms where one of the murders took place. And then the tracking, obviously, the data from his cell phone. What, what do you make of all this? And, and in your opinion, is this a slam dunk case or not really? I think all of these lead to a potentially slam dunk case. I mean, you have the DNA, which is always very convincing to a jury. Also, the cell phone data, it's not just tracking him coming and leaving. It also is that he turned off his cell phone, allegedly, in those two hours when the murder exactly happened. That to the investigators and likely to a jury would be highly problematic. The eyewitness testimony is maybe the least convincing. In general, eyewitness testimony comes with a lot of flaws and it was somewhat shaky. It was that she saw a man with bushy eyebrows. Um, what does the defense have going for them? Well, the defense has a lot going and that all they have to do is poke holes. They don't have the burden of proof. So with all of these, they could say the knife sheath well, where's the knife? We have a sheath, but no knife and no weapon at this time. Also, with the cell phone data, we see that his defense team has started to present this yeah. alibi that he's just driving at night, taking long right. drives. Will that hold up, though, to a jury? <laughs> I mean, you know, Tom, is that believable? Yeah. Not to me. Okay. I, we, we're going to have to wait and see. The judge in this case has said that, that they want cameras in court, but they want to be able to control the cameras. A lot of people are going to tune into this case. It's sort of one of those, you know, court TV type murder trials, unfortunately, for the, for the victims uh, that are involved here, for those families. Do you think the cameras will stay in court? Will, will America watch this day by day? I do think cameras will be in the courtroom, but I think the judge, when he said that, was trying to keep the media in line, saying, remember, it is up to my discretion. I can cut this. I can curtail it at any time. I can tell you, stop pointing the camera at the defendant. I can also eliminate cameras when sensitive witness testimony is happening. So the judge, to some degree, is flexing, saying it's his right. courtroom. His power, his And he's control. right, right? All right, Angela, thanks so much. Always great to have you on. When we come back, a makeshift tent city for migrants opening up here in New York. It's a big report from our America series. Why some families are actually refusing to stay there, calling the shelter unfit for women and children. That's next. Okay, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with a stabbing attack at a college campus in Louisiana. 
Police arresting 23-year-old 23 23 Louisiana Tech student after he allegedly stabbed four people, including one student. Three of those people rushed to the hospital. One of them is in critical condition. The university describing this attack as a, quote, random act of violence. In Texas, a small plane crashing into a car on a busy road. This video is pretty wild. It shows the plane barreling down the runway in McKinney before crashing through a fence and right into a car head on. That pilot was trying to make an emergency landing when the plane failed to stop. The driver was taken to a local hospital with minor injuries. No other injuries were reported. The FAA is investigating what exactly happened that plane and why it couldn't stop. The University of Utah's gymnastics head coach has been put on administrative leave following allegations of abuse. The university announcing Tom Farden's leave on Sunday effective immediately, saying the coach's actions do not align with the school's values. The move comes three weeks after world gold medalist Kara Eaker left the school and retired, saying she was verbally and emotionally abused and suffers from PTSD. At least four other student athletes have made similar claims. And former President Trump's eldest sister, Mary Ann Trump Barry, has died. Barry was a former federal judge and prosecutor in New Jersey, selected by Ronald Reagan in 1983. She went on to serve as a Clinton nominee on the third court of appeals, a position she retired from in 2019 amid investigations into the Trump family finances and allegations of tax fraud. She was 86 years old. Okay, now to the Americas and the concerns over a new migrant shelter in New York City. City officials opening doors to a tent city that can house up to 500 people. But as families arrived, many refusing to stay there, some calling the conditions unfit for women and children. Stephen Romo has the latest. Confusion and frustration at New York's newest emergency migrant shelter after a group of migrant families refused to stay in the makeshift tent city that's set up to house 500 families. The latest effort to alleviate the ongoing migrant crisis in New York City. It's not a place where you put women and children. Over the weekend, as one of the city buses dropped off families, NBC New York capturing the moment some turned around refusing to stay. This family saying the Brooklyn shelter is just too far from their children in school miles away. These individuals who decided to leave, people criticizing them for not wanting to stay there. What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, and I'm not surprised that people took one look at the setup and decided that it would not work for their family. A spokesperson for Mayor Eric Adams saying in a statement, quote, we have used every possible corner of New York City and are quite simply out of good options to shelter migrants. Going on to say that thousands more are arriving every week, adding to the more than 65,000 migrants in the city's care right now. And there are more than 200 emergency shelters in the city already. The mayor's office agrees more solutions are needed, especially for families. Floyd Bennett Field was supposed to alleviate some of those problems. Instead, some community leaders say it's creating more. It is a flood zone. Everything has to be brought in. Heat has to be brought in. Bathrooms have to be brought in. The, the, the showers have to be brought in. Water for drinking has to be brought in. A view from above shows the sprawling tent city set up on a remote runway. Inside those larger tents, small cubicles lined with green cots. Migrant advocates have raised concerns about the layout of this facility. The bathrooms are outside the living area. As a parent myself, I couldn't imagine trying to parent even one child at that location. It's also just extremely isolated. For those who have been in and seen that new shelter, some say it's just not fit for young children, raising issue about what they describe as a lack of trash receptacles, baby changing tables, and storage for residents. And pointing out, families simply require more from a shelter. There are plenty of populations, single adults or adult families that could be housed at Floyd Bennett Field. I'm simply suggesting that this is not a suitable location for families with children. The mayor's office saying they're looking into case by case scenarios, in particular when it comes to families with small children. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. So Stephen, for those families we saw in your report who didn't want to stay at the shelter, where do they go now? Yeah, they're left to fend for themselves pretty much. The city asked them to sign a waiver before they went off and left. They are welcome back at the facility anytime, they said. But right now, it's not clear exactly where each of them ended up going. But pretty much everyone here agreeing, Tom, there's not a lot of good options on the ground right now. Pretty sad. Okay. Stephen Romo for Stephen. Always great to have you on the show. Coming up next, a lion on the loose in Italy. Have you seen this story? The big cat spotted wandering the streets 
of a Roman suburb, but with no gladiators left to fight him off. How police got that line back in his cage. Stay with us. Back now with a volcano that could erupt at any moment. Residents of a fishing village in Iceland were shaken awake this morning by hundreds of earthquakes. These quakes have forced thousands to evacuate as authorities say the risk of eruption is imminent. NBC's Kelly Kobiea has this story. Tonight, nearly 4,000 people forced to evacuate in Iceland after hundreds of intense earthquakes shook this fishing village early this morning, leading to massive cracks opening up on the streets and in homes. The quakes, a warning sign of a looming volcanic eruption as a mile-long pool of lava below the town threatens to erupt. Local resident Gisli Gunnarsson and his girlfriend caught one of the strongest quakes on camera. This is a very big lava pocket and it goes straight under the town. So it, the town could just sort of disappear. Closing down the nearby Blue Lagoon, one of the country's most popular tourist destinations, and raising the aviation alert to orange. In 2010, an enormous ash cloud from the eruption of an ice capped volcano grounded flights across Europe for weeks. The region, dormant for 800 years, came back to life in 2021. Magma bursting to the surface again last year and this summer. What kind of an impact will that have, even a smaller eruption? We are looking at people losing their homes and particularly other critical infrastructure. There's a power plant, there's the Blue Lagoon. At the moment, the magma is so close to the surface um, that it could come up in a matter of potentially minutes. So it could happen in the next hours. It could happen in the next few days. We just don't know. The people from this fishing village watching and hoping their town survives. There's still a lot of uncertainty today, but even a small eruption could cause a lot of damage, according to scientists in Iceland. But they say it won't create an ash cloud like the one that grounded flights back in 2010. All right, we'll stay on top of that as travel ramps up for the Thanksgiving holiday. Kelly, thank you. Now to Top Stories Global Watch. And we begin with the urgent rescue operation underway in northern India. Officials say 40 miners were trapped on Sunday when a tunnel they were working on collapsed. Authorities say they've made contact with those miners and they have been able to supply them with water and oxygen. Rescue teams are using excavators to dig them out, but the operation has proved dangerous because of continuous falling debris. Dramatic images captured on video as dozens of wildfires rage in Bolivia. Take a look at this, this whirl of fire and smoke seen in Noel Kempf National Park near Bolivia's Amazon rainforest. Several indigenous communities forced to evacuate as the flames closed in on their homes. The local government in Santa Cruz now calling in the army and helicopters to fight those fires. And a lion escaping from the circus and running loose on the streets of Italy. Cell phone video showing Kimba the lion roaming a seaside town not too far from Rome on Saturday. Police using infrared cameras to track that predator from the skies before it was sedated and captured by authorities. An investigation is now underway into how that lion got out in the first place. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.